Wesleyan Community Online. Hi, I'm Isaac, and welcome to the Wesleyan Church Community Online. Welcome to Wesleyan Community Online. Hey, my name is Luke. Hi, my name is Graydon. Welcome, welcome to Showcan Wesleyan Church. Church. Hi, it's my, my name is Logan. Welcome to the West Community Church Online. Would you lift your hands and repeat after me? God is doing good things. God is doing good things in my life. God is doing good things in my church. I believe that God is working. Because Jesus rose from the dead, I now have access to his presence. His resurrection is my resurrection. His resurrection is my resurrection. He alone is worthy of my praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And amen. Who am I that the highest you I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. That's free, always oh, free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace from me. While I was a slave to Against me, 
I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me and not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I from the streams of pleasure flowing from your presence my longing overwhelmed me for more of you my soul thirsts pants and longs for the living God I want to come and see the face of God day and night my tears keep falling and my heart keeps crying for your help while enemies mock me over and over saying where is this God of yours why doesn't he help you so I speak over my heartbroken soul. Take courage. Remember when you used to be right out front, leading the procession of praise, when the great crowd of worshipers gathered to go into the presence of the Lord? You shouted with joy as the sound of passionate celebration filled the air and the joyous multitude of lovers honored the festival of the Lord. So then, my soul, why would you be depressed? Why would you sink into despair? Just keep hoping and waiting on God, your Savior. For no matter what, I will still sing with praise, for living before his face is my saving grace. I see the sun waking up in the morning, reviving dreams. I feel the wind on my back with promise, reminding me There's a garment of praise for heaviness There's a new song burning inside my chest Living in the goodness that He brings Get your hopes up, lift your head up let your faith rise, get your hopes up, our God is for us, he's brought us back to
Christ before me. Christ before me. Christ worshiping with us today and we're just so glad that you've uh, come to take a listen and, and hear what God wants to say to you today and we're just going to continue uh, worshiping by going to prayer and so would you pray with me Lord thank you Jesus for your goodness and your faithfulness Lord for above you there is no other and Father you are God over the storm and you are God in the storm and we thank you for your great strength and your patience and your purposes that are being uh, woven into our hearts and our lives. And today, as we thank you for your goodness and who you are, Lord, would you just continue to open our eyes and our hearts to see what you're saying to us, to hear, and to see where you're going, that we may align with you, Lord, in these days. We thank you, Father. We just thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are good, and your love endures forever. And Lord, we just, I just release your blessing to each person that is watching and that will be watching Sunday morning and after. Lord, we just release your blessing. We just release your goodness. We just release your anointing and your presence to flood every single home right now, to flood every single heart. Lord, in Jesus' name, I speak to discouragement and I command it to dissipate and leave like a dark cloud. Just go back uh, where Jesus sends you right now in Jesus' name. And I just speak hope. I just speak hope into situations that feel and seem so dark right now in Jesus' name. I speak the God of all hope to walk into that room where you are, to hold you and love you and remind you that when he died on that cross and he was resurrected from the grave, it is finished, is what he said. It is finished. And I thank you, Father, that you have qualified us by the fact that Jesus, you live in our hearts. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And that means we are accepted. We are accepted. We are on the team. And because we feel like we've been isolated and we feel like maybe we've been forgotten, we never have been and we never will be. So Lord, I just ask and I just release encouragement and strength and purpose for each home and each household uh, watching. And Lord, I just ask, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, for frustrated moms to uh, maybe older people who haven't been able to get out and socialize. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you would just give them brand new witty inventions, that you would give them courage to try something new. I ask, Lord, that you would show us what is in our hand that you want to bless and have, us have some enjoyment with in these days. Lord, I pray, Father, you would open our ears to hear you calling us to come and be with you, to get in the word, to worship and to pray. Lord, that's the source of our peace. That's who you are. Anything else is just temporary. 
So Lord, would you do these things for us today? Would you take us on the path that you have for us to walk with you today? And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you to turn to John chapter 15. We're going to come back to that in just a minute, but uh, I want to celebrate what the Lord has been doing in our church. Last Sunday, we had 107 people join us through uh, Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube, and I thank the Lord for that. On Easter Sunday, two weeks ago, we had 113 people take in the service through Zoom. Again, Zoom, Facebook, and, and YouTube. And on Easter Sunday, five people actually emailed me to recommit their lives to Christ. And so we celebrate those things. And if you're watching by Facebook today, I especially want to welcome you, and I welcome your comments. Uh, preachers love to get, you know, verbal amens. Well, I'm not getting any verbal amens these days, but I love to get your comments just to say just to be able to pray for you or to, you know, things that you would you would want to respond to in the message. So I want to encourage that and welcome that. Uh, but for fun right now, I want to introduce you to a, a teacher who decided she would write a song to encourage um, to encourage us in this time. And so but here course, it is. It is a tricky time for teachers and they're doing a great job. And this music teacher summed up how many of them are feeling with this, I've got to say, really poignant song. Hey, so as some of you guys might know, I'm a music teacher and I found that one of the best ways that I can process the whole transition to online learning and teaching is to write a song. So I wrote a song. I'd like to share that with you guys now. Here we go. Beautiful. <laughs> I kind of summed up our day, I think. That. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that. <clears throat> um, it was New Year's Eve 1990 that I proposed to the love of my life uh, to Doreen, and she said yes. And a month and a half later, I left for Europe. I've shared this story many times, but it was hard being separated from my fiance. I remember going and, and checking my ticket at the uh, at the airport, and um, after I was finished, I, I stepped aside, and my ministry partner Eric Hallett uh, checked his his ticket and his bags, you know. And um, I, I remember overhearing the lady behind the ticket counter saying, "Is your to Eric saying to, is your friend okay? He looks pretty troubled." <laughs> and I was, I was, I had just said goodbye to my fiance, and I was missing her, and we were, I was going to be away for five and a half months, and I wasn't sure if she was going to. You know, you have questions. Is she going to wait for me? We're supposed to get married two weeks after I get back. I don't necessarily recommend doing that. It was a trip of a lifetime. I love the experience, but I, at times it was hard to be separated from the woman that I that I loved. Well, these are days that, um, for some of us especially, maybe you're finding it hard to be separated from from your normal routine, from people you love. And by the way, it's okay to admit I. This is hard. It doesn't mean you've backslidden or that you, you're a terrible person if you admit this is a kind of a hard time. It's an uncertain time. Well, and yet in Romans chapter 8, spiritually, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of God? We're going to come back to that in just a minute. But uh, last week we looked at the last week we looked at the one question Jesus asked Peter three times in John chapter 21. Three times he said to uh, to Peter, Peter, do you love me? feed my sheep? Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than anything else? More than anybody else? Am I first in your life? Because he knew that he would soon be physically separated from, from him. In John chapter 13, verse 16, we're going to backtrack a little bit, a few chapters, and we're going to look at when Jesus was sharing the um, Last Supper with his, his disciples, and uh, he knew he would be he would be separated from them pretty soon. He was going to die pretty soon. And so he wanted to share with them that, that time. And um, a couple weeks ago, I was walking around, around the outside of the church. I, I like to walk and pray. And I was just praying about this whole situation. Lord, we're, we're separate from each other. Things may never be the same. I don't know. But how are we to go forward in these uncertain days? And the Holy Spirit just brought this verse from John chapter 14 to mind. He just said, I am the way. Jesus said that to his disciples. It's like Jesus was saying, hey, I'm going where you where I'm going. You can't come. And they're like, well, tell us what the way and we'll come. And, and Jesus said, I am the way. And these are his last words to his disciples, the, these chapters. And these are the very leaders of the very first church. And they will soon launch the church. And so Jesus spends his last moments before he goes to his death talking about, I'm going to use the word abiding. 
it essentially talks about the word abiding. The NIV uses the word remain. And so I'm going to let um, Liliana Smith read the scripture this morning, but it's as if abiding is the key to future effectiveness. That's really what Jesus is saying. Abiding is the key to your future effectiveness, you guys. And so here's Liliana with the scripture. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he trims and cleans every branch that produces fruit, so it will produce even more fruit. You are already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can produce fruit alone. It must remain in the vine. It is the same within you. You cannot produce fruit alone. You must remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a person remains in me and I remain in him, and he, then he produces much fruit. But without me, he can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, then he is like a branch that is thrown away. That branch dies. People pick up dead branches, throw them into the fire, and burn them. Remain in me and follow my teachings. If you do this, then you can ask for anything you want and it will be given to you. You should produce much fruit and show that you are my followers. This brings glory to my Father. I love you as the Father loved me and remain in my love. I have obeyed my Father's commands and I remain in his love. In the same way, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. I have told you these things so you can have the same joy I have. I want your joy to be the fullest joy. This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. Thanks, Liliana, for reading the scripture this morning. Well, I'm revisiting a message that I shared back in um, 2015, but it's a scripture that I, I come back to often, just personally, because, because it's so incredible. Number one, let's talk about fruit bearing from John 15. Jesus puts a high priority on fruit bearing. In fact, Jesus is passionate that his followers bear fruit. He even says in verse 2, we just read, he cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. If you're not fruit bearing, it's like, you're out. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty serious. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Not only that, but people's lives who are actually bearing fruit, he says he will actually do something that sounds counterintuitive. He says, while every branch that does bear fruit, in verse 2, he says he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. I don't know about you, but pruning can be painful. And then he verse says in verse 8, verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Well, this is what Christ's followers do. This is what disciples of Jesus do. They bear fruit. You can actually identify a, tr a tree by its fruit. Uh, you should be able to identify Jesus by his followers. I don't know a lot about trees, but when I see a bunch of apples underneath a tree, I think, well, gee, I think that might be an apple tree. <laughs> well, it should be the same with Jesus' followers. When people meet us, they should be able to see, oh, that's a follower of Jesus. An example is found in Acts chapter 14, verse 13. Looking ahead later on after the church had been birthed, it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. Now catch this. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. There was something about them. They thought, they didn't know, maybe they didn't know much about Jesus, but they thought, well, these guys, they're just like Jesus. I can tell because of the way they're, they're handling themselves, perhaps. You should be able to identify a Christian by their fruit. We're designed to bear fruit. I looked at the word bear fruit in my thesaurus. It means to get results, to succeed, to be successful, to be effective, to be profitable. Winston Churchill once said, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. It's probably a good idea to, what kind of fruit are you bearing? What, what's the result of your life? It's good to ask ourselves the question, is my life bearing fruit? Is my, my church bearing fruit? What kind of fruit am I bearing? Am I bearing fruit that is going to last for all of eternity? Or is it just like a temporary thing? Is it for the glory of God? Or is it for the glory of me? Or... There's a hindrance to fruit bearing that, that's huge. And people struggle with this. I have struggled with this at times. People struggle with this still after all this time. And the hindrance is thinking that we're manufacturers of fruit. Listen to what Warren Beer Wearsby says in his book on being a servant of God. He says, you can manufacture a lot of things. You can manufacture golf balls, pens, flashlights. You cannot manufacture fruit. 
It has to come from life. The trouble with too many of us is that we think God has called us to be manufacturers when he really called us to be distributors. He alone has the resources to meet human needs. All we can do is receive his riches and share them with others. When it comes to ministry, all of us are bankrupt and only God is rich. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Jesus said in verse 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. We get that mixed up sometimes. All right? we, we think that we're the source of, of, of the results. All right? We're the source of the good things that are going to happen in our church. No, nah, Jesus said it's the other way around. I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm actually the source of anything that's going to good that's going to come out of your church or out of your life. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I am him, all right, that abiding thing, he will bear much fruit. And then he says this statement that has challenged me for decades as a pastor, as a disciple of Jesus. Here it is. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Just let that sink in for a minute. It reminds me of Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, where it says, stop your striving. You know, stop trying to make stuff happen. Stop trying to manufacture something that can't be manufactured. Stop your striving and you will see that I am God. And I'll add, I'm God and you're not. That's a relief. Actually, it should be a relief to some of us. Stop trying to manufacture something. Stop striving. Warren Wiersbe says there are three ways to do the Lord's work. There are three ways to bear fruit. Number one, go ahead and do it. Just jump in and do it. Number two, do it and ask the Lord to bless it. Number three, find out what God wants and do it. I like number three. Well, the key to fruit bearing is number two, abiding. That's the King James Version word. The NIV uses the word remain. We're using the word abide today. As a teenager, occasionally we'd be traveling, you know, country roads and and we would see uh, somebody in a, we would follow somebody in a pickup truck. Remember the days of the bench seats? Those were good days. We could put four or five people together and we, we didn't, you know, seat belts weren't an issue and I don't know how we ever survived. But anyway, uh, we would see somebody in a pickup truck and it was just the twilight of the day when it wasn't really quite night yet, but you know, and so it was kind of dark. And so I would look ahead and it would be a friend of mine, maybe and his girlfriend. And I would say, hey guys, my, my brothers, hey guys, that driver has two heads. Well, what was I referring to? I was referring to the fact that they were sitting close together. It was hard to determine where the driver ended and where the passenger began. They were, they were close together. Well, that's kind of what abiding is, sort of. In a similar way, if you take, if you take a vine and you take a branch and you can't... If you take a vine and you take a branch and you can't tell where the branch begins and the vine ends because they're... Vi fibers are interconnected. That's what abiding is. In verse 4, it says, remain or abide in me, and I will remain and abide in you. We have a part to play in this. Stay connected to Jesus so you can't tell where Jesus ends and you begin. In the message, it says, live in me, make your home in me. A, a home is a place you return to regularly. There's a, there's a connection, isn't there? There's an ongoing connection. Uh, the Amplified Version uses the word dwell with me. There's a lot of places I've visited. I visited some uh, places that I'm, I'm excited to tell you about. I visited Brazil 30-some years ago and spent three weeks there in the, the eastern city of Fortaleza, Brazil, and had a, an incredible experience there. But I didn't live there. I just visited there. I love to tell people I went to Europe like 30 years ago and I, I stood under the Eiffel Tower. I stood in front of, in front of Buckingham Palace. I, I uh, hiked the Swiss Alps. I went to Venice. I stood, you know, and looked at the, um, the Roman Colosseum. And I, stood, I saw all these world famous things. You know, I love to tell people I've been to Europe, but I didn't live there. I didn't dwell there. I just visited there. That's somehow, sometimes that's the way we look at Jesus. We've We've, you know, prayed a prayer and checked a box on a card one day. And Jesus is saying, he didn't ask us if we've done that. He, he's, he's saying, hey, abide in me. Stay there. Stay there. You know, when it comes to uh, 
leaders in the church, you know, being responsible for setting direction or, or spending the budget or whatever. Um, I find myself more and more, uh, if we haven't been abiding, if we haven't been regularly like seeking the Lord together, I find myself not wanting to even have a leadership team. I find myself not wanting even to meet with the board because if we're not abiding together, I'm concerned that we might end up doing just what I want to do or, or just what I think or just what an outspoken board member thinks ought to be done. Or, or there's this one. You've heard of the, the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Sometimes there's, in any organization, sometimes there's somebody that's you know upset or maybe uh, didn't get the memo and needs to have something explained and there's a time to go and explain that. But if we're not abiding with the Lord, we might find ourselves reacting instead of responding and maybe reacting in ways that are not what God wants to teach us in the process. You hear it? Are you with me? Are you with me? In John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said, I do nothing on my own. Jesus said this, but say only what the Father taught. What is that? That's in part, I'm so close to God the Father. I'm so connected to him. I just do what he wants me to do. It's as if we're one. It says in John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. That's abiding. That's obedience. John 5, 19, it says in the New Living Translation, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing. There's that word nothing again. The Son can do nothing. Jesus can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does. There's that close connection. John 14 verse 9 says, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. John 14 verse 10, right? the chapter before, the one that we're looking at today, he says, Jesus says, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. And it's, it's like Jesus is saying, look at the fruit of my life and you'll know where I came from. That's kind of what he's saying. So two questions. And I'm not going to answer these questions for you. I think I already have, but I'll let you answer these questions. Number one, how did Jesus know what the Father wanted? And number two, how are we going to know what the Father wants? One of the things I like to do is is, uh, bicycle. I I have several bikes and just bought a new one last year, actually. But when my kids were young, um, I loved having the bike seat, you know, the baby seat behind my seat. And so I'd have my kids ride along back there. I remember Adam, when he was a a toddler, would sit back there and he would yell at his older brother, James. James is old enough to have his own bike. And James was kind of a maverick, you know, kind of wanted to do his own thing. And and, uh, I remember having... Adam yell at James as if he had full authority to tell James, his his older brother, what to do. And he would say, James, you get back here. James, you get back here right now. (laughs) As if he had full authority over his brother. Well, those are fun times. But I remember when Adam got a little older, I bought uh, what they called a a, um, a co-pilot. It was a one-wheeled bike. And it had handlebars, had a seat, had pedals. But it it only had one wheel because it was connected to the seat post of my bicycle. Okay, and so wherever I went, Adam went. All right, until I got that, I was constantly, you know, yelling at my yelling in a good way. I think at my kids to say, "Hey, hey, don't go through that stop sign. Hey, don't go on that side of the road. Stay on the right side of the road. Hey, don't go too far ahead." I wanted to have them stay with me. That's really what I was saying. Hey, stay with me. It was for their protection. I wanted them to stay as long as they were with me. I knew they were okay. As long as they were with me, I knew they were okay, and things would go much better. Well. We, we uh, bought this co-pilot, and he was with me wherever I went, he went. I didn't have to worry about him going somewhere else because he was connected to me as he rode along. He could paddle, not paddle, didn't matter. He was with me. Well, the Holy Spirit is not just with us. He's in us. In fact, think of it this way. If I had Jesus in, um, 
if we had Jesus with us in the flesh, you know, standing with us in the flesh, walking everywhere we went, with his arm around us, whispering strength and encouragement. Let me ask you a question. What problem would I face that would be too big? Well, Jesus said, we actually have something better than this. He says in John chapter 16, verse 7 in the Amplified Version, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to uh, be with you, to be in close fellowship with you. What's he describing? That's abiding. He says, here's what it looks like. Here's how you can be one with the Father just as I have been one with the Father. So here's a thought. Pastor Bill Johnson from the famous church out in Redding, California. It's known for Bethel music. Here's what he says. If my relationship with the Holy Spirit is not better than having Jesus with me in person, then I'm not capitalizing on the presence of God in my life. Let me just let you think about that for a minute. In other words, I'm not abiding. I want to cross-reference for a minute with the, the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8 builds to the end. Romans chapter 8 is one of my favorite, along with John 15, but it's one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. And it builds to the end where, uh, where the writer says, under the anointing and, and direction of the Holy Spirit, he says this, God's word, there is nothing in the universe... In verse 38, there's nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. What's he implying? He is implying that every assault of the enemy, and then he lists the assaults of the enemy, right? <laughs> nothing can separate us. Every assault of the enemy, here he goes. I'm convinced of this. Love will triumph over death. Somebody needs to hear that today. Life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens, there is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that can ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us. I love that word lavish, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Listen, all the opposition that we face is to separate me from my awareness of the love of God is to keep us from abiding. It's to keep us from knowing who we are, for, to keep us from living in the security of God's love for us. That's the number one target. It means that the number one reality in my life is that God loves me. In 1962, theologian Karl Barth was asked if, if he could summarize his theology in a single sentence. Barth responded, as the story goes, he responded by saying, in the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee, here it is, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So then, Bill Johnson puts it this way, if that is the greatest reality in my life, for me to live unconscious of it is to live conscious of too many other realities. I talked to an individual this week who confessed that, I, you know what, I've been spending too much time on Facebook. And what this person was really saying is, I've been spending too much time on Facebook and not enough time abiding with Jesus and letting his love flow through me. I'm not saying, she wasn't saying Facebook was wrong, but there's a lot of things that come through Facebook that aren't always in line with what Jesus would say. And so they didn't have the power and the, the peace and the courage maybe or the compassion that, that we need when we let other realities that only come from the Holy Spirit when we're connected with them instead of being constantly connected with the, the Holy Spirit abiding. Well, become a black belt in abiding then. Become a black belt. I read an article a while back called what it means to be a black belt. I've shared this before, but it's so good. As I, as I read this, relate this to what it means to spiritually abide in Christ. 
okay? Become a black belt in abiding. Here's what, me, what it means to be a black belt in karate, but relate this spiritually, here it is. Martial arts is not simply a means of self-defense, but also a way of life. It is a state of mind that unfolds over the course of one's journey to become a black belt. Most students beginning this journey are, seeing, are, are seeking to receive a black belt. It is when they realize that a black belt is not something you earn, but something you become, that they will truly understand what it means to be a black belt. Jesus, the words, Jesus used the word remain, we're using the word abide, 11 times in 17 chapters. All right, it's as if Jesus is saying, you know what, you need to understand this. Uh, the church is about to be launched, and if it's going to be successful, if it's going to bear fruit, if we're going to, if we're going to deal with the fact that I'm not physically going to be with you, and if you're going to be able to go forward in power and in victory, you've got to master this. You, you've got to understand that without me, you can do nothing. That's, that's such a challenging verse, isn't it? Without me, you can do nothing. You've got to master this. As a church, we need to ask ourselves, are we abiding in Jesus? Or are we abiding in our own, I don't know, need to be needed or something? Are we abiding in something else? Is he really the focus? Is his presence really the one that it's directing? Is his word the one, the thing that's really directing us and guiding us in what we should be doing? Well, the key to abiding, I spent a lot of time on that, but there's so much more to be said about it. But the key to abiding is obeying. The key to fruit bearing is abiding. The key to fruit bearing is um, key, the key to fruit bearing is abiding. The key to abiding is obeying. Number uh, verse ten it says Jesus says if big word in that uh, key word in that sentence if we have a part to play if you keep my commands that's what we can do that's not manufacturing that's just obeying if we keep my commands you will remain in my love. What's that mean? You'll abide. That's how we abide in it, by doing what he wants us to do. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. The key word is if. The condition is, is obeying. If you're not obeying, in other words, you're not abiding. It's been said that the secret to victorious Christian living is simple. Pray and obey. I always encourage you every Sunday to have a, a, a personal quiet time where you talk to the Lord in prayer every day and let him talk to you uh, by reading the Bible and for half an hour, an hour, whatever you can do. But I always say this, and I always mean it because this is what the Bible teaches. The key isn't just that you've read your Bible and prayed. The key is that you're willing to do what God wants you to do. The key is that you're willing to obey and say, God, you're the boss. That's what abiding is. The secret to abiding is obeying. Well, the secret to obeying, if you're not obeying, you're not abiding. Well, the secret to obeying is, is loving. I remember um, in 1989, <laughs> my, uh, my college roommate had gra graduated a year before me. So I was in my, my senior year in college. He had taken a church in a, a wonderful place called Sanford, Nova Scotia. He was the pastor of his own church, fresh out of college. And I remember visiting him on a weekend. And I remember he, he immediately asked me a question. He said, how's it going with Doreen? I was dating Doreen at the time, and he actually knew Doreen before I did. Uh, and she was from, they were from the same area. He said, how's it going with her? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. Or, you know, it's, I, I love getting letters from her. I love getting to know her through mail, but I don't know. I don't see how it can go anywhere. I don't see how there's a future because she lives in, in another country and I'm in Canada and we're hundreds of miles apart. We never see each other physically. And it's just like, I don't know if there's a future. Well, he said, well, you need to call her and you need to invite her to your house to meet your parents at Christmas time. And then he said something that I knew was the Holy Spirit because he's the cheapest guy. He was the cheapest guy you'd ever meet. He says, and I'll pay for the phone call. This is before there were phone plans and, and technology and all that. And I thought, boy, the Holy Spirit must be really speaking to me. And so I called her and invited her to meet my, my family at Christmas time. And she accepted and, you know, and the relationship went on. But if you're going to love somebody, there needs to be an expression of that love at some point, doesn't there? There needs to be a tangible expression of that love. John chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. That's, that's that abiding thing. 
as I have loved you. Just receive his love and just pass it on. Be a conduit of my love. That's what Jesus is really saying. John 14, 23, Jesus says, if anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Sometimes we think loving him is only praying. Well, you know what? Praying could, the, the devil will twist anything. He could twist even praying so that we don't have to really obey. I mean, praying in itself is obeying, but the devil can just twist anything. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Well, to, the key to loving is number five, knowing Jesus. John 17, 25, Jesus said, I have made you known to them. He's talking about God. He's talking to his father now, God the Father. I've made you known to them, Father, and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. He's describing abiding. He's saying, God, Father, I want them to have the kind of abiding relationship that you and I have had because, because when they pray, I want them to be able to do what I have been doing and even more than what I have been doing. The Bible actually says that. I want them to bear fruit. I want them to see the miracles that I have seen because I've abided in you. If they'll abide in me, that means they're abiding in you and they can be one like we are and they're going to see the kind of things that we're going to see. And so there's a cycle here. Knowing Jesus is where the five keys to living all begin, but there's a cycle. The cycle is, first of all, Jesus expect us, expects us to bear fruit. Well, the key to bearing fruit is abiding. The key to abiding is obeying. The key to obeying is loving. The key to loving is knowing Jesus. And if you do that, man, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to be able to ask anything. That's the promise. See, see, we think we can ask anything and skip the abiding part. It doesn't work that way. I've had people that say, well, I tried, I tried religion and it didn't work. Well, it didn't work because they didn't do their part. They didn't abide abide and press into the thing that's really going to get us somewhere. And that's our, our walk with the Lord, that, that connection with the Lord. Well, in closing, leading up to the day of Pentecost, which is, are the days that we're in, after Jesus had risen and ascended into heaven, what were the disciples doing? All right, they were separated from each other physically. And so what were they doing in this and that, that uncertain time while they were leaning on his promise and doing what he told them to do? He told them, hey, don't leave Jerusalem until you've received the gift that I promised. In Acts 1, 14, it says they all joined together constantly in prayer. What were they? they were abiding before the Holy Spirit was even given, before it was even personal. It's hard to be personal in prayer until the Holy Spirit comes. Um, Acts 2 verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Well, this year, Pentecost is Sunday, May 31st, and it's my hope that we can all be together in one place. Physically, I hope we can. I, I don't want to say that we're going to be for sure, but I hope we can. If not, we'll get together in, through technology and we'll make it work, but my hope is that we can be get together in one place, however that looks. Why? So that we can be constantly in prayer, so that we can abide and so that we can receive a fresh outpouring of the gift that Jesus promised is available to us and is the key to our future, the key to effectiveness in ministry, the key to purity and power because we're dead in the water without it. We really are. In Romans 12, it talks about how we're supposed to live, be living sacrifices, presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, as our spiritual act of worship. You know what the trouble of living sacrifices is? We keep crawling off the altar. What's God saying to you this morning? I want to encourage you just to obey. Would you bow your head for a minute and just close your eyes, pause and listen. Holy Spirit, we're listening. We've been listening. What are you saying to me through this message today? Maybe you've been doing lots of abiding but it's been abiding in other things maybe even things that are not necessarily evil in and of themselves but they've not been Jesus and so you're not getting the benefits you're not getting the the life that comes through being connected with Jesus I want to encourage you if you need to repent and just say God I've, I've gotten off track I want to come back today I want to abide I want to encourage you to do that love to hear your comments love to have you email me if you want to make a specific commitment man do it Man, do it. Man, do it. 
Eternity is at stake here. Eternity is at stake here. I want to encourage you, be obedient. Let's abide. Let's get a grip on this abiding thing. Let's become a black belt in abiding as a church.
Lord, I thank you that we are secure in you. And nothing can separate us from your love, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we can abide in you. Father, thank you that nothing can separate us. Nothing can separate us. Thank you, Lord. We just lean into you. We just love you today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise your name. I have a couple of announcements. Um, thank you for sending in your tithes and offerings. There are two options. One, you can send by mail to Wesleyan Community Church. That's at 19 Dubois Road. The second option is go to the website, showcanwesleyan.com, and click Give Online. We want to remind you that Wednesday is a fasting and prayer day. Ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you fast. Some suggestions include coffee, dessert, a meal. You can also join Pastor Andy on Facebook Live at noon for a brief devotional and prayer to encourage you. Join us for a Zoom prayer meeting at 6.30 p.m. that night. Thank you to our leadership team for gathering for prayer Sunday mornings by Zoom at 9 to 9.30. And please join us next Sunday online at Zoom, Facebook Live, or YouTube. Each day, Thank but you. would you raise your hands right now for the blessing of the benediction? May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth your saving power among all nations. Now go 